I'm gonna show you 10 vocal production tips that are almost guaranteed gonna make your music sound better. Let's do it. Number one, you need to make sure that you're actually using the right mic for the room that you are in. See, a lot of home studio producers see these nice, fancy condenser microphones like this, and they're thinking, well, shoot, if I'm gonna do the real music producing thing, I gotta get one of these. But the thing is, if you're in a room like this that has absolutely no acoustic treatment, or even if you just have foam acoustic treatment and you're using microphones like this, which are super sensitive, it's gonna sound like crap. So instead, you wanna make sure that you are using a mic that will actually sound pretty good in a room like that, which would be microphones like these, the Shure SM58, a Shure SM7B, which are dynamic microphones, or if you wanna go with a condenser microphone, the Loudon LS208 is by far the best option that's gonna work in a room that's not very well treated. If you're using the wrong mic for the wrong room, it's gonna sound like garbage. Number two, if you're recording a song that is really dynamic, like the verse is really quiet, the chorus is loud, then the verse is really quiet, and then the bridge is super loud, and all the different dynamic levels, then what you need to make sure you actually do is just the gain on your interface or preamp. So instead of just recording something really soft and then having to crank the volume or crank the gain within your DAW afterwards, so what you wanna do instead is increase the actual gain on your preamp. So if you're just using an interface, you would just crank it up on the interface itself. But if you're using a preamp like me, then you're gonna just increase or decrease the actual output gain. The main thing is that you don't wanna be doing this all after the fact. You wanna get it done right away, which is just getting really good source. So adjust the verses and the choruses based on volume for that particular song. It's gonna make your life so much easier. Number three, don't ever delete your take folders. So in Logic, if we record a vocal and we have all of our different takes here, you never wanna delete this. So I'm gonna show you a really good alternative. You can do this in other DAWs. Pro Tools has this option as well. But if you're using Logic, this is a little bit more relevant. Go down to Track Header Compose components, track alternatives, and what you can do is you can duplicate this. So let's go ahead and say this is the comp that I actually want to use, which is a combination of different takes. But when we want to actually take care of our pitch correction, tuning, and some of the other things that we got to do on this, we don't want to be doing that within an actual take folder. We want to be doing that on a flattened track. But you don't want to delete this take folder because there are circumstances where you might actually get into this, delete the take folder, and then realize, oh crap, I wanted to use a different take for something, and you deleted it. Don't ever delete it. So option one is to create track alternatives like this. So we now have track alternative A and B. And so what I would do is rename this track B to edits. And now I'd rename track alternative A to comp. So now I can go between these edits and the comp. So if I go to edits here, I can go in here, flatten this, and now deletes the actual take folder. But if we ever need to go back, we can open this up and go back to the comp. If you're not using Logic and this particular thing is not possible within your DAW, here's what you would do instead. You duplicate this track so you have two copies of it. Copy down your take folder into one and then just simply mute and hide and then you can go ahead and flatten that out. So if you ever need to go back to the other comp, you can go to your hidden tracks, you can unhide that and then now you can grab whatever you need to grab from that and you're good to go. Number four, make sure you are the proper distance from the mic also based on the specific mic that you are using. So this is the Loudon LA220, which for this microphone, if I'm standing about six inches to a foot away from the microphone, it's gonna capture really, really well. However, if I'm using something like the Shure SM58 or the Loudon LS208, these handle audio very differently. If I am this far away from the Loudon LS208, which is still a large diaphragm condenser microphone, it's not gonna sound very good. I'm gonna have to get about this close to the microphone in order for this to sound the way it really should. The same thing for a dynamic mic like a Shure SM58 or Shure SM7B. You need to get right on this microphone in order for it to capture properly. So pretty much the rule of thumb is if you're using a large diaphragm microphone like this, you're gonna wanna be six to 12 inches away from the microphone. However, like I said, the Loudon LS208, this is a large diaphragm condenser microphone, but you need to get a lot closer to it. So you need to actually experiment with your microphone. What I recommend doing is test recording close, a little bit further away, and a little bit further away and really pay attention to the tonal quality of the vocal. There are so many vocals that I've heard from some of my students where I can just tell you're standing too far away from the microphone, you're losing all the low mids. Number five, if you're recording a vocal and the dynamic range is really consistent all the way through one section, but then all of a sudden at the end of a verse or going into a chorus, it gets really loud. You're not in a position where you can simply just change the gain on the interface like we talked about earlier. A lot of vocalists are gonna do this. They're gonna back up from the microphone. Well, the problem with that is, similar to what we just talked about before, that's going to change the tonal quality of the vocal. So if you have this really nice, low, mid-range sounding vocal, it's nice and meaty, and then you step away from the microphone because you got super loud, you're gonna lose all of that low mid-range, which is gonna sound super weird because it's gonna just thin out as you go further away from the microphone. So here is what you should do instead. There's actually two tips in this one tip. Tip number one is you would simply turn your head at about a 45 degree angle. You sing about this way. That way you stay the same distance from the microphone, but the amount of volume that is actually going into the microphone is not quite as much. That's the number one. Number two is you would simply raise the microphone up 
angle it downward like this. Actually, this is still a little bit too high, right about here. And so you'd make it so that when you're singing the main vocals, you could kind of tilt your head upward a little bit so you're singing straight into it. But then when you sing those loud parts, you would actually sing straight. And this is accomplishing the exact same thing as the first one. Some singers are just not gonna wanna turn their head at a 45 degree angle. So it might be a little bit easier for you to just angle your mic like this. You're welcome. Also make sure you use a pop filter. I wasn't using a pop filter. Use a pop filter. Number six, try using non-lyrical vocals within your music. It can make such a huge difference. There's something about a human voice if you use it in your music in ways that is not just like singing the lead melody or harmonies. If you incorporate non-lyrical vocals into your music, it can just be, it's awesome, okay? And this works in virtually every single genre. The way I'm using it in this particular track here is in gang vocal form, which means I've got layers of these vocals, so it sounds like a bigger group of people singing. But this is what it sounds like with no gang vocals. But let's go ahead and check out what it sounds like when I take those gang vocals and I have those vocals doing the same thing that the strings are doing to add just a completely different vibe to it. Check this out. So as you can see here, I have multiple layers. I think we did eight different layers of that same vocal. We just panned them all over the place. We put a ton of reverb on them and compressed them and kind of distorted them a little bit. And this helps make it so that it sounds one, really big, but then two, it just adds such a great vibe to the track. So next time you're working on a production, see if there's some cool ways of working in non-lyrical vocals. Tip number seven, once you have actually recorded your vocals, you are most likely going to need to automate those vocals. And I know a lot of people don't like that, but it's true, you're mostly gonna have to automate your vocals. But when most people actually reach for the fader to do volume automation, I'm instead going to tell you what you should do is put the gain plugin at the very beginning of your chain. You can see here I have gain right here at the very beginning, and I'm actually going to automate the gain instead of the actual fader. And here is why. If we look at this, we can see all the automation that we have. I'm actually automating the gain tool itself. So if we were to play this, Where have I been? you can see the actual gain this. is changing. And here is why, because now if ever I need to change the volume down the road, instead of having to now grab all of this automation and dropping it down or boosting it up or whatever, I have a single fader that I can grab. I can move that around and it's literally just gonna take the entirety of that and change the global volume and we don't have to do it with automation anymore. This is gonna save you so much time, it's gonna save you a lot of frustration because so often what happens is, is you automate your vocals at the very beginning of the process, and then as you get further along in the mix process, you have to turn things down. And so instead of having to grab all this automation and turn all the automation down, like you would normally have to do, all we have to do is grab the single volume fader, push it down 3 dB, 5 dB, whatever the case it is, and we're done. It doesn't actually change the global automation on that vocal. Tip number eight, instead of using a single compressor on a vocal, I almost always am going to use a technique called serial compression. And what this means is we are running a single vocal through multiple layers of compression through a vocal chain. So you can see right here, I have two separate compressors and the vocal is going through both of them. And the reason that you want to do this is because if you are compressing one single vocal a single time and you want say 10 dB of gain reduction, using 10 dB of gain reduction on a single compressor is going to sound a lot more aggressive than doing 5 dB on one compressor and then 5 5 dB on a second compressor. In the grand scheme of things, I'm usually using three, maybe even four compressors on a vocal. It's just on the actual vocal chain itself, I'm using two. So the main concept is, is that when you are working with a vocal, if you want a vocal that is really nicely compressed without making it sound over the top, you'd want to use multiple layers of compression to basically ease into it. So if we were to actually listen to this vocal, you'll see how each of these are working. So this one's doing a little bit, and this one's also doing a little bit. And so as a result, we're getting a nice little bit of compression, but no one compressor is having to work too hard. Number nine, when you are working with the vocal, another really great way of having more creative vocals is to find creative places to automate reverb and delay. So on this particular vocal here in the chorus, let's just go ahead and listen to it. I wanna live life worth living. 
So what I'm doing is between each of these little phrases that she sings, I am actually automating this reverb to go up over time. So if we actually look at this bus itself, this right here is where the reverb is on. And you can see that I've automated the vocal to be swelling along with her actual vocal as she's singing it. So when she's in between these phrases, this is a really good place to put either vocal throws or delay throws where you're doing something like this, where you're automating it up. You could use a delay, you could use a reverb. In this particular case, a reverb made a little bit more sense since it's supposed to sound a little more flowy and ethereal. But if we listen to this and actually look at how this automation curve happens, so I'm using round with an almost five second decay on this. And let's go ahead and listen. And now that you can see the actual automation happening, use your ears to see how this sounds. I wanna live life worth So when she's actually singing, I push it down so that reverb isn't just drowning over her voice. But then when she's saying the tail end of that phrase, it goes up so it just kind of sprays out that reverb. And this is such a useful technique. I use this all over. If you want reverbs and delays to sound more interesting, trust me, this is one of the best ways of doing it. And number 10, if you want your vocals to have some punch, you want to cut through, a lot of people are just gonna reach for EQ. But one of the best things you can do is actually use saturation, distortion, tape plugins, or using preamp emulations like Sound Toys Radiator. So let's go ahead and take a look at this vocal and see if we can make it sound even more amped up. Now there's already a lot of aggression on here because I've already processed this, but if I really want this to cut even more, the very first thing that I would do is be going to something like Effect Rack within Sound Toys, and I'd be grabbing Decapitator. Now check how this sounds on this vocal. Let's just solo the vocal out, put a little bit of drive, and then we're gonna adjust the mix. And one of the things I like, I like this end style. And so I'm gonna bypass this first, and then we're gonna play it back and listen. Sky on fire. All right, that's with it on. Obviously, as I start pushing up the wetness and as I start pushing up the drive on this, it's gonna get even more aggressive. But in the context of this whole track, it really fits the style that I'm going for. And again, this isn't something that's gonna work on every single genre, but listen. Sky on fire. So here's some of the go-to plugins that I would use. Obviously, you've got Decapitator. That's probably the best one. That's the one I use the most. You could also use Devil Lock. Devil Lock is really good. That's gonna add a lot more aggression to it. But if you wanna go a little bit more subtle, you could use something like Radiator, which I actually already did on this track earlier in the chain. You can see here, I'm using some Radiator to push some treble. This is gonna be a little bit more on the subtle side. And then another one that is fantastic to use for this type of stuff is the Baby Audio Tape Plugin. And this is gonna give you that reel-to-reel -reel type tape sound, which this can really work well if you want your vocals to have some more character to it. But when it's all said and done, if you want your vocals to have more character, sound a little more edgy, EQ is great for bringing up some brightness and shimmer, but if you want to be making it more edgy, distortion, saturation, uh, preamp emulations, and tape style plugins, those are what's going to make the biggest difference. Let me know down in the comments below what your favorite one of these tips was, and if you like this video, I can pretty much guarantee you'll like this one as well. We'll see you in the next one.